Breath is the grammar of life. It determines the space between the living and the dead, and it provides a singular beacon for the dying. If ever death had a demonstrable counterpoint, it would most surely be breath. Byron Ditch knew this better than anyone, having the life-sustaining stuff denied him to a painful degree. For years, he lay within a tomb for the living, a first-generation iron lung. His body festered for lack of any real life his mind taking up the burdens better hefted by hearty flesh. Despite his biological failings and perhaps why the damnation machine found such favor with him, Byron never allowed his mind to dull, filling it with all the vitality his body failed to cultivate or sustain. His nurses were always well paid and granted unusual license to take up his opulent home's comforts for their own so long as they ministered to him all the reading of dusty books he requested. Every recitation concerned some wizened philosopher's treatise on being, each one chasing after the question of why. It was Byron's personal quest for meaning within a tiny, metal, meaningless world. He was only a child when he developed polio. His wealthy parents heaped upon the boy all the things a child could ever want, but never what he truly yearned for his own breath. The situation would be temporary, he was told. But due to the cruel efficiency with which the disease had mastered his body, it was not. That is, until a certain man came to him in the dead of the night, whispering promises that blended with the howling wind without the great windows of his ancestral home. The man entered his room, it seemed to him, from the very shadows themselves, working them like doors. His thin voice at Byron's ear like a chorus of spiders weaving sparkling silks into intricate webs. The man explained that Byron had stretched for too long beneath those tall windows, trapped in the library-turned-bedroom beneath the cathedral ceiling, upon which artists had cast their choicest visions from books he could never hold. For all his family's extravagance and his nurse's indulgence, all he had truly treated himself to was a handsome prison with merciful keepers. The man made an offer impossible for the invalid to refuse. While the prospect of being placed in yet another machine was far from ideal, and rather ironic, Byron was willing to do whatever he could to reclaim his life. It didn't matter to him what insignia the men who came for him wore. He was only too grateful when they arrived late in the evening, packing him into a white panel truck bound for emancipation. Equal was his fierce indifference to whatever authority might oblige him for the miracle. None of it mattered. Above all, Byron wanted the air. The floor beneath the wind collapsed into that final note of his enemy's composition, the song from hell. He never lost a contest for the air before, yet he might have been cheated. The song was too beautiful, too soulful, and as much as he hadn't wanted to admit it, he needed to hear it out. He'd been fooled into believing the ballad would end as beautifully as it had begun, if not more so. His ruptured eardrums and cracked bones sang a different tune. Byron became the heir, the bindings of his body breaking apart for the freeing of his pneumatic soul into the wind, allowing it to hover unseen over the smoking remains of the last stag. Using the wind to locate his escaped prisoner, he inspected every hidey hole the breeze was privy to, sparing no cave or crack or ditch his inspection. Search as he might, the Malsapien had vanished perhaps into the notes of one of his tricky songs. Regardless, he was at no loss for adversaries, as the sound of conflict was thick around the city. Descending into the business district of Curious Forest, Byron beheld the physical incarnation of his ally, the crowd. It was a form he didn't often resort to, so the werewind assumed the occasion a special one. The expensive china had been set, and now a worthy conversation would endure for the sake of it. His teammate was facing off with the Malsapien he'd been charged with healing, 
the one Byron himself had crushed almost to death. But now the man seemed no worse for the fact, appearing in exquisite health, larger and fiercer than before. Having the opportunity to watch what promised an interesting exchange, the werewind floated in place, spectating. The location, combined with his invisibility, proved a safe and effective vantage. When the other Malsapiens converged upon the conflict, he would be there and ready, the air poised for their defeat. Byron looked on as Henry wasted little time greeting his charging opponent, bringing down his threaded fists like a hammer, cracking open a chasm in the street, but missing his target entirely. The smaller combatant was long gone by the time the blow struck, already behind the giant, delivering a swift kick to the back of his knee, which failed to fell the giant. The Oversapien threw a vicious backhand at the smaller man's head. Rather than vanishing as before, the Malsapien caught the speeding fist and heaved the giant over his shoulder. The Titan pinwheeled through the air, crashing through a brick wall of a bakery, bringing the roof down in the process. The moment reflected the hubris of the Oversapiens, assuming that two of them would suffice against all three Malsapiens. Yet the lone passenger was proving at least an equal to his larger opponent, mastering his foe with as much grace as precision. The victor of the exchange didn't miss a beat, sprinting into the milling dust plume after his enemy, teeth grit and eyes ablaze. Moments later, after Henry could be heard howling out his rage, the building exploded. The giant hovered into the air above the wreckage, revealing another ability within his considerable repertoire. Rage stretched his features beyond human restrictions. His mind created biology, allowing emotion and uncommon sway over its expressiveness. The enormous Oversapien glared down at the remains of the bakery, seeking out his foe. But the other was nowhere to be seen. Even Byron, for whom the air itself was as good as nerve receptors, could not sense where the man had vanished. Henry clenched his teeth and stared with venom at the spaces below him. Like an invisible fist slamming into the remains of the building, an unseen force flattened the ruins to dust and cratered the earth beneath. Byron wondered how many additional thralls were called upon to die, so that Henry might leech from them the power for such telekinetic might. After surveying the smoldering pit he'd made, Henry descended, confident of his victory. An instant after his feet touched the ground, a stop sign streaked through the air from the opposite side of the street, the placard portion acting like the fletching of an arrow, bursting through the neck of the Oversapien. His knees buckled, his hands feeling for the post where it protruded from beneath his chin, a kind of protoplasm spurting from the wound. The attack was so fast even Byron hadn't detected it. The Malsapien leapt from the cover of a small stand of trees, descending upon his fallen foe. Byron struck Mars from his course with a peal of gale-force wind. The Malsapien tumbled along the road, colliding with a parked car, flipping it over. Staggering from the crumpled vehicle, Mars began to gasp for air. Had only the air lips to smile with, Byron would have been beaming. The werewind had all but rekindled his glee for denying the man breath when he felt his grip over the air going numb. The world was being stripped from him, again. He thought of the very instant he was placed into the first machine that transformed him, when the world shrank to a constricting metal box. His ephemeral body shuddered as he recalled how the murals painted across the ceiling would gradually vanish by the slow fade of dying candlelight leaving him dead but for the cold rhythm of the machine that both denied and supplied his existence. Once refused the questing winds, he was rendered insensate, a man invisible to both himself and the world, wind without breath and life without living. Forced to draw himself whole from the thin air, he fell to the ground with a dull, metallic thud. Once he pushed the painful memories aside, he knew what was happening, or more to the point, who was happening. From what he recollected of the sense stealer's abilities, she hadn't truly robbed him of the air, only the ability to detect it. With that fact firmly in mind, the werewind allowed his thoughts to run black, 
as dark and bleak as the sky before a storm. The wind began to howl once again, far stronger than before. From where she hid in the deep thickets, Hazel watched horror-stricken as the passing line of armed men and women collapsed to the ground, their heads dissolving into indecipherable globs of churning gore. She barely kept her stomach in check as she looked on, the process of dissolution continuing in earnest, sounding out the rising vapors where they swelled from the sludge and burst like great red boils. The curvature of so many skulls surrendering to gravity as they rendered down. In moments, a train of headless bodies lie still and steaming under the canopy of night. Despite the molten spectacle, her mind was fixed upon Eric, the man she'd left to die. She prayed his voice wasn't among the chorus of screams that had exploded from every corner of the woods, sounds so blood-curdling they might have risen from the grave itself. She'd almost abandoned her mission, taking refuge in the brambles, contemplating her escape. Yet she knew the price of desertion, what would be denied her should she fail to do the bidding of her nameless lords. She lingered in place, hoping for an opportunity to move on to the city, to save the teammates she'd never met. Realizing that a battle must be unfurling, as the sounds of gunfire and explosions were thick, much like the clouds of smoke that rose over the trees, she followed the sounds of carnage. With the pursuing mob and unmoving confusion of blood and brain, she was free to renew her course. Creeping to the edge of the woods, she peered into the small city, where the signs of a battle were prevalent. She also couldn't help but notice the continuation of a certain trend of topless torsos, as well as several more traditionally pulverized corpses. Those that hadn't been shot between the eyes looked as if they'd been bludgeoned to death. The wind intensified at her last glimpse of the eastern section of the city, shrieking through the streets like a lost soul. The resulting dusts and blowing detritus obscured what she thought might be persons milling about the greatest concentration of smoke and burgeoning storm. Cloaking herself in the past, she made her way across the street. Movement within the temporal sphere was like wading through tar, as she had to force herself against the natural flow of time. The wind had become a howling menace for the few minutes she was out of step with the present, violent enough to throw tree branches and rooftops from their earthly anchors. Thunder roared overhead as the regressor entered the maze of alleyways that flanked the business district, looking to escape what had now become a vulture's sky, a wheeling grayness that seemed to eyeball the weak and weary chasing them to shelter, lest they prove prey to the powers above them. A rusty service entrance opened with a desperate shove, and Hazel stepped inside, scanning the last moments of the room for signs of danger. The lighting was dim and intermittent, no doubt from the storm wheeling overhead, so she used the room's previous illumination to see. She was in a warehouse, or back room of some kind. Surrounded by paintings and sketches in large crates marked with shipping labels. Every bit of art was filled with images of strange industry. People merged with biological machine-like devices, all gathered around a monstrous skeleton that only hinted at the behemoth it once fortified. The goal of the undertaking concerned the reconstruction, and likely revivification, of the fallen monster as every device was busy plying the corpse with new flesh and fresh bones. She was just a child during the great darkness, but like everyone else who lived through it, her dreams held a whisper of what the world had all but forgotten, and those intimations lined up well with the spirits underlying the images now surrounding her. There was always a temptation for her to glimpse into that forsaken year, but whenever she approached it, the world grew unsteady as if poised on a crumbling cliff that overhung oblivion. She drew no closer than was necessary, and never tempted a complete look. While the feel of the room might have evoked the darkness, the inspiration behind the art seemed unusually vital, held in place by powers more recent than the bygone catastrophe. She needed to know if her discovery related to her mission. Perhaps the Oversapiens were connected to a scheme more insidious than just apprehending her teammates. 
Certainly, their fondness for melting large numbers of human heads suggested such a possibility. Looking out two windows, the material one recessed into the wall that revealed the present alley, and another immaterial vantage overlaying it, revealing its past, Hazel beheld the strangeness that seemed to define the very name of the city. Given the amount of activity that took place within the narrow back alley, she assumed the work was not clandestine, but a shared enterprise involving the entire city. With the efficiency of ants, the citizens unloaded large vats, machine parts, and bulging body bags into the rear entrances of various buildings, their movements and expressions nearly mechanical and lifeless. This condition matched the behavior she'd come to expect from the locals. Yet there was a distinction only one who haunts the past could discern. A presence did move over these people, but it was conspicuously absent the now dissipated thralls of the forest. Here was a power that exuded the timelessness of the darkness, an effulgence of dread that hung in the air like the smoke of an endless fire. Whenever she encountered such intimations, it was always the same. A paradox whereby something infinite inhabited the limited extents of prosaic time, which was itself revealed by that presence to be almost trivial. This complemented another of her impressions of the darkness. An eternity of debauchery somehow contained within the narrow boundaries of a single year. She concluded that whatever lurked Curious Forest was kith and kin to the spirit of the darkness, and like the darkness, she wanted no part of it. Hazel moved to the front of the building to find a store full of olden curios arranged atop numerous shelves, an antique shop. She stood before a set of wide display windows that should have afforded a view of the streets, but instead revealed a rushing chaos of smoke and rain and debris. As she moved closer to see what insights the past might hold, a massive shadow pressed itself against the glass. The floor vibrated beneath her feet as the thing moved closer. A massive bronze man topped by a mane of flowing golden hair stooped before her, the rage of the storm falling across him like a breeze. Compromising the perfection of the giant, a gaping wound peered from his throat, outlined in pinkish blood. A smile lifted his face at the sight of her. There you are. The man boomed above the wind. Hazel backpedaled from the glass as he wound back his fist. Another hand, tightened and corpse white, enfolded the man's arm. A new shadow eclipsed the first, dwarfing the bronzed giant. A burst of cold frosted over the windows, and Hazel's breath came out as a mist. A rumbling, croaking voice defied the wailing wind. And there you are. Henry. <laughs> Hazel retreated from the window, turning to run once her back hit the wall, sending a display of Georgian silverware tumbling from its perch. Before she'd gotten past the crates and piled artwork, the back door smashed open. Three hideous figures loped out of the storm, their eyes bulging from their sockets, blood running from where their swollen skulls breached scalp. I'm not an easy person to evade, little rock thrower, they spoke in unison. So I'll grant you points for managing to do so, if even for so small a time. The humanoids withdrew knives and stalked forward. Hazel felt her terror becoming anger. She withdrew the fragment of deer antler from her pocket and reached into its history, searching its prehistoric lineage assembling the most formidable shape its ancestry could offer. The Megaloceros. The creature appeared not unlike a colossal moose, yet three times larger, and with a rack of antlers sufficient to impale a small army. The beast reared up with a roar, sending one of the horrors to the floor and the other stumbling backwards. The ancient monster lowered its hugely antlered head and charged impaling two of the men on horns thicker than harpoons and trampling the third. Crashing through the doors as if they were cardboard, the creature entered the storm. Hazel staggered to the beast, her skin wrinkled, a streak of gray parting the amber of her hair. 
Pain and age slowed her ascent to the creature's back, wincing as she climbed up its deadly headdress, past where her enemies dangled like gruesome ornaments. Once seated, she squinted into the source of the howling wind. A tornado the likes of which she had never seen corkscrewed down from the black sky, the finger of God about to lay waste the city. <laughs>